Well, today we're going to be continuing in our study in the book of Isaiah. Last week, I had my friend Sam to come and preach. And uh, last week, I wasn't here because I was in Orlando, Florida for a John Maxwell leadership conference and had a great time of renewal and, and personal um, growth over there. And, and so I had Sam to come and preach. And at first, I was a little bummed out because I gave, like, in our schedule, I had to give him Isaiah chapter 40. And that to me was like the cream of the crop, right? I spent all, all year long kind of setting up the stage. And I'm like, we're going to get to the good stuff. And then bam, chapter 40 comes. And I'm like, oh, Sam, here you go. <laughs> go ahead and preach it. And I was a little bummed out. But, but I know that from 40 on, it's still all good. So I'm, I'm still very excited to come back. Um, to, to the book of Isaiah, okay? So you need your Bible. Take out your physical Bible, your paper Bible, or your digital Bible. Or if you don't have a Bible, um, just kind of raise your hand and maybe our ushers in the back will, will help you uh, get some Bibles because we're going to be digging in a lot to the Word today. So today we're going to have our fingers in two places. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 40 and you can bookmark also 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Okay, Isaiah 40 and 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And we're going to be flipping back and forth among these two sections. I asked, what is one of the biggest fears in your life? What are you afraid of? What are some answers that you gave that, that you, got, you thought was pretty good? Either you gave it or you heard it. Maybe you will have a couple people share. Just sh you can just shout out the person next to you's fear. Just let us all know. It's fine. Oh, okay. Afraid of mama. That's a real fear. What else? What else? What else are you afraid of? Huh? Being completely alone. Yeah, loneliness, isolation. Very true. Very true. What else? One more. Losing memory. Being unconscious. Okay. That's a real fear, especially as, as the years goes past. That's a very real thing. Okay, so the message today is titled, Don't Be Afraid, Because I'm With You. God says, don't be afraid because I am with you. I'm going to paint the narrative, paint the picture, set the background for God's message this morning. So, as we know that by now, you know how many books are in the Bible? 66 books, right? How many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? 66. So the book of Isaiah is like a mini Bible, as we've said many times before, going from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 39, and here Isaiah prophesies about Assyria. Well, he talks about the sins of Judah, right? He he, he, he condemns Judah for their sin, for their idolatry, for all the wrongs that they've done, and a lot of judgment words. So, so the first 39 chapters, it was a little hard to hear. It was a bit hard to sit through because there, was, there were a lot of judgment words. And then finally it came to pass in the actual history of things. Before it was prophecy, prophecy. Now, chapter 37, 38, 39, it happened a serious attack, but God delivered them. And then from chapter 39, and Sam talked about this last week a bit, as we jump to chapter 40 to 66, now we come into a whole new section. But it's, it's a very strange jump. Okay, If you go to uh, your Bibles, if you look at chapter 39, it's about Hezekiah's last days. All right, King Hezekiah's last days. And then to chapter 40, it bang, begins with comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. And it's like, what, what is this disconnect? Because between chapter 39 and chapter 40, there's a hundred, roughly a 150-year gap. Chapter 39 was around 701 B.C. That was the siege of Jerusalem by Assyria. All right? And then a 150-year gap. And then Isaiah prophesies to 
people in Babylon, the captives in Babylon. It's like, well, then what happened here? If we don't understand this 150-year history, it's not going to make sense. We're just going to be reading Bibles and bits and pieces. We're going to treat it like a box of chocolate. You just take out the ones that you like. You know, you open up a box of C's candy, and you're like, I like that one with the peanuts. I like that one with the caramel. I don't want the rest because I don't like that. Right? And sometimes we could treat the Bible that way. Oh, I like this passage. I like that passage. But we don't understand the context of what's going on. And so I, I got to fill it in for you guys. I got to fill in that 150 year gap. But where is it? Where's the 100? From chapter 39 to 40, there's nothing in the middle. So where do I find the 150 year gap? So now we got to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Okay. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And from here, from here, the first half of chapter 36, it talks about the last uh, uh, years of Hezekiah, right? So he died, and then he had a son. And he had a son named Manasseh. Sorry, I got to take you... 2 Chronicles chapter 33, not 36, 33, okay? So his son was born, and his name was Manasseh. So chapter 33, verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years, 55 years, the longest in, in uh, Judah's history, 55 years in Jerusalem, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord Verse 3, for he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, has broken down, and he raised up altars for the Baals, meaning that he, he started setting up idol worship once again. His father was good. His father was a man of God. But for some reason, some reason unknown, Manasseh, King Manasseh, started doing evil again, started idol worshiping again. Okay, verse 6, also he caused his sons to pass through the fires in the valley of the sons of Hanum. Hmm. So this was like a, a sorcery type of practice. Before um, their, their giant false god, their statues, there's fire in the front, okay? And, and somehow they had a ritual where they had to get their children, their babies, and pass them through the fire. Very dangerous. I'm not sure if he just passed them through the fire or if he actually sacrificed the sons in the fire, which is also possible because children, child sacrifice was a thing back then, okay? Completely evil, completely evil, okay? You sacrifice your children so that the gods will give you victory in war or, or, or for some other reasons, okay? Just really, really evil. Verse 6, he practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set carved images, the idols which he had made in the house of God. So child sacrifice, witchcraft, sorcery, consults mediums, spiritists. So completely goes against God because God says, do not touch those things. Don't consult those things. Those are demonic powers demonic influences. And so he's, he's totally using the, the, the powers and the sources of Satan to kind of fuel his, his kingship, okay? And he even set idols in the temple. It's enough that he was setting it in his own room or his, in his own castle, but now he goes into the temple of God and sets up images there, idols there. All right. What's worse? Verse 9, so Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So meaning that he, he didn't just do this for himself, he actually seduced the entire nation of Judah to do this with him. Oh, it's not enough that I, I, I worship demonic spirits. It's not enough that I worship false idols and false gods. Now, I'm going to get all of my people to do it with me. It's as if one day, Pastor Casey goes astray, and I start worshiping false gods, 
And I'm like, this is so cool. You know, I see all this cool stuff when I, when I do demon worship. All these crazy things happen. You know, it's a, it's a wild party. This is so fun. It's not enough that I do it. I'm going to get Amy to do it. I'm going to get Micah and Karis and Caden and Skylar to do it. And I'm going to get all of you to do it with me. Because, man, it's a party. Demonic worship is a party. All right. And I get all you guys into it. Wouldn't that be like, that's pretty sick, right? And that's what Manessa was doing. Complete evil in the eyes of God. And, and, legend has it that he, Manessa, was the one that finished off the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied for 52 years in the nation of Judah. Well, how did it end? Well, it was Manessa. Manessa heard enough of Isaiah talking words of condemnation to him, always rebuking him, right? Because they're both old by this time. Like Manessa reigned for 52 years. Isaiah, I mean, he reigned for 55, and Isaiah prophesied for 52. And so they're both old people. And, and Isaiah is constantly saying, Manessa, you're doing wrong. You're doing evil in the sight of God. You've got to repent. He had it. He just had it. He, put, he, he, he got a tree trunk, a cedar, cedar tree, all right? He, he, he put, he kind of emptied the middle, put Isaiah in the tree, and, and then sawed him in half. And that, that was a horrible way to die. Sawed Isaiah into two, okay? And so completely evil. And I, I would think, man, this, this guy is kind of like Hitler or something, you know? Like just complete, the, the personification of evil, one of the worst kings, or arguably the worst king in, in Israel, Judah history. This guy deserves to go to hell, if anybody did. Then what happens? Verse 10. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon the captains of the armies of the kings of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetter, and carried him off to Babylon. And so as a punishment, God allowed Assyria to attack Manasseh, held him captive, put a hook on him. What kind of hook? It was a nose hook. So imagine a giant nose hook that goes through your nose right there and carries you with a chain, and you're dragged, being dragged like a slave into Babylon. All right? If you're cuffed by the hands, that's not too bad. Cuffed by the ankles, that's not too bad. Imagine being cuffed by the nose, a nose hook, just a hook that goes into it, you being dragged by it. Complete humiliation, total pain, total torment, all right? Imagine walking 500 miles with a nose hook in your nose, all right? Then what happened? Verse 12, now he was in affliction. He was being tortured. He implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the Lord his Father before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, like, like he was pleading to the Lord, okay? The Lord heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. It's like, what? Wait a minute, this, this completely evil king, this Hitler type of king, what happened? When he got nose hooked to Babylon, he felt so bad he humbled himself and he repented. And the Lord actually heard his prayers and forgave him and brought him back from Babylon to Jerusalem and gave him back the throne? What is going on? What? God, is this right? Did, did you actually forgive him, this completely evil king? D doesn't your mercy have a limit? Isn't there a boundary that once we cross it, we don't come back from? But in his case, we see this infinite mercy of God. And no matter how evil a person becomes, he was a murderer. He was an idolater. He was everything that was evil in the book. And yet the Lord had mercy upon him. 
and brought him back to Jerusalem. Then what happened? What was Manasseh's response? Verse 15, He took away the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord and all the altars he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. He cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offering on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord of God Israel. What? He's actually doing the right things? He got rid of the altars? He got rid of all the, all the sorcery and the witchcraft stuff? And he started serving the Lord? That kind of blows my mind. Because the Bible says he was the worst king ever. And then at the end of his life, he actually finished well. That blew my mind. Okay? And then he dies. He died a, a nice old man. He reigned for 55 years. All right. Manessa. Remember his life lesson. No matter how far you've gone, all right, some of us may be living in sin and rebellion, but there's mercy for us if we return to him in repentance. And then his son was 22 years old when he became king. Okay, this is verse 21 of chapter 33. And then he reigned two years in Jerusalem, and he also did evil in the sight of God. All right, he reigned for only two years? Well, what happened? Verse 24. Then his servants conspired against them and killed him in his own house. Whoa. Amon, just like Manasseh, did evil in the sight of God, but he only had a two-year window. After that, the Lord finished them off. His servants killed him. And I look at these two in contrast. 55 years and then two years. Why does such a big difference Maybe his son, Amon, maybe he was thinking, oh man, dad, he was a bad, he was a bad, horrible man, all right? I know it, I'm his son, but he just used his life to, to party, to do whatever he wanted. I can do the same, all right? Because he lived a long, wicked life, and then he just finished in, uh, right with God. Maybe I'll do the same. And so he did evil in the sight of God. He had no sense of urgency to be right with God. And so he did his own thing. Worshipped idols, did all those crazy things. And he thought he would have a long time, just like his dad. But then God finished him off in two years. And so the lesson that we can learn from that is, like, we can't wait. Like, oh, I'm just going to party all my life, do whatever I want. And then on my deathbed, I'll just say, say a prayer and I'll go to heaven. That is a very, very risky thing to do. And I know people that have that type of mentality. All right? Okay. So, Amen's life should let us know that we should have a sense of urgency when it comes to our relationship with God. Don't play with God, don't play games. You don't know how long you're going to live. You just don't know. All right, he was a young man when he died. Okay, how old was he? He was 22, and he reigned for two years. That means he was only 24 years old when he died. Okay, we don't have forever. We don't know. And then his son, Josiah. Now Josiah is a character. Josiah is a, is, is a, he's a great boy. When he took the throne, it says Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Eight years old. How many of you are eight? No one here is eight. Eight's like a little boy. You're not eight. You don't even look eight. You got to be at least 12 to be here. <laughs> he was just a tiny little cute boy, eight years old when he became king. And Josiah reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of God. And he walked in the ways of his father David. And he didn't turn to the left or to the right. This is chapter 34, okay? Follow along. For in the eighth year of his reign, that means he's 16 years old now. At 16 years old, while he was still young, he began to seek God of his father David. So he, talk, he talks about this young man, 16 years old. Right for uh, coming to Lighthouse. If he, if he lived in this time, he would, he would be in Lighthouse right now, in 10th grade, right? And it talks about this young man of 16 years old seeking God with his whole heart. 
his whole heart. So don't, don't look down upon your age like, oh, I'm only 16, I can't do nothing. No, you can pursue God with all you got. That was Josiah. And what did he do? He purged Judah and Jerusalem of, uh, of the high places, the wooden images and the carved images and the molded images, okay? So he, clean, he purged it of evil. He did right. He cleansed the temple. And then later on, it says he sent uh, one of his servants um, to, to the temple. And he's like, here, here's this money. Go to a temple, hire some people, and, and clean it. Repair everything that is broken. All right, here's some money, and go fix the temple. So his man goes, and he sees the high priest. And he's like, here's the money, you know, fix, fix, fix everything. Fix all the furniture, repaint the place, you know, redo the flooring, redo the tiles, redo the pillars. Just, just give it a complete makeover, a major makeover for the temple so people can go and worship there. So the high priest, um, Hilkiah, he goes and he's like, okay, we'll, we'll do this. Oh, by the way, here, we found something, all right? We found something. Here, here's the book of the law. What? What's the book of the law? It was the book of Deuteronomy. You know, back then, they had it in scrolls, okay? So that means they lost the word of God. They lost the scroll, the, the law of God. They lost Deuteronomy, which is what they recite in the temple. It seems as if they lost it for years. They couldn't even find it. And so the high priest, he's like, good news. We finally found it. Here you go. And he's like, hmm, I think this is important. I should take it back to the king. So he takes the scroll back to the king all right? And he read it before the king. And then verse 19, this is what happened. Thus it happened, when the king heard the word of the law, then he tore his clothes. He's like, ah, he ripped it like a WWF star, you know? Ah, he was com- Why do people rip their clothes back then? Because they were what? They were sad. They were grieving. That's why they ripped their clothes. If I rip my clothes right now, you think I'm crazy. But in their culture, it was the symbol of their grief. And why did he do that? After he heard um, God's word read to him? Because in Deuteronomy, it talked about how the Israelites, how they should live and behave. Right? And so as they read it, he's hearing, we're not doing this. As a people of God, we are not doing any of this. Okay? And so he says, for great is the wrath of the Lord as poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. And so Josiah, who is grieving for his people, that they've been a rebellious people. And so he prayed to the Lord. He repented before the Lord. And so God says to him in verse 27, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God, you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I have heard you. And so God has mercy upon Josiah and his people. All right. So during Josiah's reign, God was good to his people. Well, Josiah dies at the age of 39 in battle. I'm like, oh, shoot. I don't like to hear that number associated with death. That's my number. I'm 39. I don't want to hear no king dying at 39. Because I'm like, that, Lord, that does not apply to me, okay? <laughs> so he dies. And then for the kings that follow, this is, I, I coined this term, okay? This is from me. I didn't read it from no commentary. I call it the three skunk kings. Three skunk kings because all three kings that followed Josiah, they stunk. They stunk before the Lord. They did evil in the sight of God, Okay? And because of that, for three generations, three kings, they did evil in the sight of God. God was pretty furious with the kings and the leadership of Jerusalem. And so finally God had it. All right, so in chapter 36, verse 15, here comes the big one. This is the day that every Jew around the world knows, 587 B.C. That is like, for them, that, that was like World War II, okay? 587 B.C. was when God allowed the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and his army to come and invade Jerusalem 
Remember, did, did Assyria take down Jerusalem? I want to see if you guys were paying attention. Did Assyria ever take down Jerusalem? Remember I talked about the siege of 701, and they came to the city of Jerusalem to lay it to siege? Did they ever attack it and take over it? Yes or no? J just guess. You have a 50% chance of getting it right. No, they didn't. They never took Jerusalem because God took Shannacharib back and killed him. Remember that? So, so they were like, oh, whoo. Well, 150 years later, the siege of 587, now this worked because it was God's punishment upon Jerusalem. So what happened? The Lord's, okay, verse, verse 15, the Lord God sent messengers to, to them out of his compassion. Like, come and repent, people. But they mocked the messengers of God. They made fun of the prophets. Okay, they despised his word, scoffed at his prophet, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, until there was no remedy. There was no cure for the evil that was in their heart. And that was it. That was the final straw. Verse 17, Therefore God brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men, with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young men or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them into his hand, and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, and all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants or slaves to him and his sons until the ruler, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the law, the Lord, by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. And so in this section, it talks about the complete destruction of Jerusalem, which has never, ever happened before. So this was their big, big day, okay? It's as if Washington, D.C. got completely leveled by our enemies, all right? That, that, it, it's like that, all right? They burned the house of God. They burned down the temple. They flattened the city. You know what's Jerusalem famous for when people go to Jerusalem? They go to the Wailing Wall and they pray at the, those big walls, Right? They destroy the walls. They flatten the entire city, okay? And so, the city was desolate. The people held, the, carried off to Babylon, okay? Now, that's what happened in those 150 years. That was the gap. Good king, bad king. Bad king, bad king, bad king, skunk king, stunk, stinky king, then the fall of the great city of Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of kings, fallen to Babylon. How do you think they felt? Hmm? These people that got carried off with chains around their wrist, around their ankles, around their nose, carried off to an enemy, enemy state to become their servants. How do you think they felt? They were starving. They had disease. When they were under siege, they even resorted to cannibalism. They ate their own because they were so hungry. And now that their city's gone, they're now slaves. They're poor, they're needy, they're thirsty without water. All right? Jerusalem was this place of rich greens, all these amazing trees and waters and springs of waters and fountains. And then they get carried off to Babylon, which is a desert, wilderness, the people of the sand, if you will, you know, people of Babylon. It was the kingdom on sand, wilderness, hot, like 120, 130 degrees, thirsty, without water, right? poor, needy, thirsty. That's where we jump in to chapter 41. After that 150-year gap, now we come to chapter 41, okay? Actually, 
Actually, I'm going to go back a little bit, go to chapter 40. And that's where the famous chapter of Isaiah 40 comes. And that's when, um, what uh, Sam talked about, right? Chapter 40 goes, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort my people. They're, they're slaves. They're poor, needy, and thirsty. Comfort my people who are suffering. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, for her warfare is ended. You know, by this time, they've been slaves for decades. And God is saying, your war is now over. Your iniquity, your sins have been pardoned. It has been forgiven. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people. So now, it's over. The war is over. The captivity will be over. Your suffering will be over. So Isaiah is saying, comfort my people. And guess what? You know what the crazy thing is? By this time, Isaiah is already dead. This is 150 years later. Isaiah is already dead. Dead. He's in a coffin somewhere in half. All right? He, he was cut in half. But his word, his prophecy stays alive and is giving hope to the people, to the Jewish people in Babylon, giving them hope. Our bodies like grass, it will wither away, but the word of God will stand forever. The words of the prophets will stand forever. Okay. And so we go to chapter 41, and Isaiah prophesies to the people. He prophesies to the people in Babylon, to the Babylonians, and the Jewish people. There's two audiences, okay? So this is the voice of God. Keep silence before me, O coastlands. What are coastlands? Coastlands is like the nations, you know? In the Mediterranean uh, Sea, along the Mediterranean places, there's a lot of country um, that touches the Dead Sea and touches the Mediterranean Sea. And so all those nations are like coastlands. So he's saying, be silent. Before me, O coastlands, and let the people renew their strength. Let my people who are suffering in slavery renew their strength. And, and then he goes into this, pro, into this word, which is very, very interesting. God says, who, who raised up one from the east? Who in righteousness call him to his feet? What's he talking about? God is giving a challenge to the people of Babylon but also giving hope to the Jewish people. He's asking this question of who, but he's actually referring to himself. Who did this? I'm doing this. Who's raising up one from the east? Meaning, in the east, in the near future, I will rise up a warrior, a king from the east, that will come to rescue you guys. Who is that king from the east that's going to come and rescue them? Do you guys know? Was it talked about last week? Do you guys know who that is? God's going to raise up this person from the east, all right? Who gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings? Who gave him as the dust to his sword and driven stubble to his bow? All right. So he, God is saying, I'm going to raise this, guy's, this guy up, and his enemy is going to be dust to the sword. He, he's he's going to conquer so fast, it's going to be as if he didn't even like, step on the ground. That, that's the picture they're painting. He didn't even step on the ground to fight. He just, he just kind of flew by the ground. And every place that he flew by, he ran by, he conquered. And throughout history, there was, there was that one king who conquered so fast, like no other king before him, that every, every other nation was, was deathly afraid of him. Okay? Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. So God is saying, who raised this guy up to save you? Who gave him the power to conquer all his enemies? Who gave him the, the speed to do it the, at, at the pace that he did? It is me, the Lord. God is in control. The coast, verse 5 of chapter 41, the coastland saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid. What were the nations afraid of? What, did the ends of? what were the people of the nations afraid of? They were afraid of this man that was going to rise up from the east, that God was going to raise up. 
okay? And that man, his name is Cyrus, King Cyrus of Persia. In history, we know that Cyrus of Persia later on defeated the Babylonian Empire. And later on, he established with great speed, like never before, the kingdom of Persia. And, and they were a superpower for a long time. Okay. So God is comforting the Jewish people. Don't worry. I'm going to raise up a king from the east. And guess what? He's not even a Jew. He, he's a pagan king. He's a, he's a Gentile king. But I'm going to use him. I'm going to put my spirit upon him. And he's going to come and rescue you guys. And then the voice changes. And then in verse 8, he says, But you, Israel, God's, God's now talking to his people. But you, Israel, you are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Now he's talking to the Jewish people. He's like, he calls, he calls him by Jacob because Jacob was, you know, Jacob's original name, right? The trickster, the cheat, the heel grabber, the one that stole the birthright from Esau. I know you're weak. I know you have your sins. I know you have your backgrounds, Jacob. But this, I chose you despite of this. I chose you and gave you a destiny. So I named you Israel. And Israel means prevailing with your struggle with God and with man. I know you struggle. I know you wrestle with God. I know you wrestle with man. But at the end, you're going to come out victorious. So Jacob, I have called you. Israel, that is your destiny. You are going to be victorious. And verse 9, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servants. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Imagine you guys are in captivity. You guys are in enemy territory as slaves, all right? You guys are complete hopeless. That's what your face looks like. You're sad. You're long-faced. You know, all your, you know, give me a, give me a sad long face, you know? Can't, can't see a sad long face because you guys are in captivity. You, you're slaves. Don't be, don't smile. You're a slave. Don't smile. Be completely sad. Don't be sleeping, though. If you're a slave and you're sleeping, they whoop you. Okay. And God says, I have chosen you, and I have not cast you away. And they're hearing this, and they're like, but we are cast away. And God says, no, no, no. You're not cast away. I'm going to bring you guys back. And he says here, the famous verse, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not. Don't be afraid because I am with you. It doesn't matter that you're in enemy territory. I know your sufferings. I know you're being tortured. I know that you are poor. I know you're needy. I know you're hungry. I know you're thirsty. I know you're isolated. I know you feel rejected. I know you have fears in your heart. Apply that to our own lives. God says, I know the fears that are in your heart. I know you're afraid of isolation, being rejected. I know you're afraid of losing your memory, of not remembering things. I know you're afraid of your uncertain future. You don't know what college you're going to go to. Be, you feel rejected in school. Maybe you don't have a lot of friends. Maybe you're lacking in your finances right now. Maybe you're in a lot of debt. You can't climb out of it. Maybe you have a relational crisis with your family. You don't get along with your parents. You don't get along with your sons and daughters. God says, I know, for I am with you. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Don't be in despair. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. 
Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What is it that you're going through right now? I want you to just kind of close your eyes right now at this moment. No matter what the fear is in your heart, no matter what struggles and troubles you're going through right now, God knows and God's telling you, I know. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What area of life you feel hopeless in right now? I want you to imagine, just kind of hold out your hand and place whatever that fear is, like imagine it as a thing and put it on your hand. So, so put out your hand and put that fear into your hand right now. Just place it right in front of you. And just imagine that you take hold of that fear in your heart, that trouble in your heart. Would you grab it and just symbolically offer it up to the Lord? Just lift your hand a a little bit and just symbolically letting the Lord know, Lord, this is my fear. This is my trouble. Would you take it from me? Would you help me? Would you deliver me? Would you rescue me from this situation? Because I feel really hopeless right now. In this situation, would you help me in this? Just take a few seconds to pray to God. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We come, with, we come to you with our fears, our troubles. God, would you take it from us, God? Give us the strength to endure. Be present in this time of need. Lord, according to your word, you say you will strengthen us so that we can endure through our troubles. That we can have the courage to face it despite of our fear. I pray that you would comfort your people right now. I pray that you would strengthen your people right now. Let strength, let courage, let comfort come on our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Be encouraged by the word of God. I hope that you would recite chapter 41, verse 10 to yourself this week. That whatever struggles you're going through, that you place your hand upon this verse and you say, God, I know you're telling me, don't be afraid. And I won't because you are with me. Amen.